Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or as we say in India, bhaiyo or behno, brothers and sisters. It's so good to be here. Such a good turnout. That's excellent. My name is Irfan. I am the chef at Badal, the Indian restaurant at the far end of Crittenden, the one that everyone complains about <laughs> because it is so far. <laughs> it takes a long bike ride to get there. Uh, I'm the chef of the first Indian restaurant. Uh, I cook Indian food as a passion, and today is an extremely exciting day for me because today it seems like the teacher has come home and when a teacher comes to your doorstep, it is a day that you are ecstatic. And I'm really, really pleased to present today's guest. He was born in Amritsar. He is a Michelin starred guest. He is a filmmaker, a humanitarian, and the host of MasterChef India, which is a show that's based on MasterChef UK. He has studied in, in prestigious Institutes in India, including the Welcome Group School of Hotels, has worked at the Taj Group, the Oberoi, the Leela Group. For those who are not from India, this is probably strange to you, but for us who grew up in India, these were institutions to be associated with, and he has been in all of them. He has also studied at the Culinary Institute of, of America, Cornell University, the New York University, and Le Cordon Bleu. He is, he has, he is no stranger to the television. He was a consultant chef on Gordon Ramsay's TV show Kitchen Nightmares. He appeared as a judge and Indian cuisine specialist on the two-part season finale of Hell's Kitchen. He appeared, uh, he appeared on Throwdown with Bobby Flay as a judge, but if he actually threw down with Bobby Flay, I'm sure he would have won. <laughs> <laughs> and he's also been on the India show on uh, the Martha Stewart's uh, show telecast on March 2011. He is, he's hosted the MasterChef India, uh, two seasons, I believe, the second season. Four seasons. I'm a little behind. He has authored, uh, the website says 13 books, but I think it's more now. Uh, but Spice Story of India, Modern Indian Cooking, Flavors First, and now Return to Rivers. I am so proud to present Mr. Vikas Khanna. Welcome, Vikas. Please take a seat. Hi. We're going to sit together like we like each other. <laughs> so, Vikas, how have you been? How was your, how's your visit uh, in the Bay Area so far? Tell us about your first impression. I'm a total New Yorker. <clears throat> no driver's lessons, no patience. <laughs> in Punjabi, say, but the bees. Like, you know. <laughs> I'm total, because from my hometown, I landed straight in Manhattan. It's like those movies we ever watched where they got freedom and they came to America. It could be after World War II, but I think I was fighting a war with myself to come to US. Uh, but it's, besides that, it's fantastic. It doesn't stop snowing when you're in New York. And <laughs> We love the pictures, but to be in the real pictures, it's horrible. And I love the sun here. And it's thanks to Andrea, who got me to the West Coast. And it was on my agenda. I lived in California, but for some time. And it's, it's a great place, because I have so much respect for all of you, because you all have driver's license. <laughs> and you drive so well. <laughs> I can only drive in my hometown in Amritsar. <clears throat> I can, because I know all the cops and nobody ever stops me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can go anyway. It's total freedom, I think. But uh, besides that, I'm so proud to be, you're the first people actually, one of the first few people in, in America who are seeing this book. And it's something about, you know, there's something very strange about holding your book because, you know, you see the rough drafts and you do the, all the sketching. I wrote this whole book in Punjabi, my native language. And then we couldn't find anybody to translate that from English to English. You know? So it's like, and this is, this is something which you, <clears throat> I call this book as a, something, a symbol of rebirth for me. I don't know if I can ever do this book again. It's very scary. Because I remember one interview I read as a child for Tanzing, the guy who climbed Mount Everest, what was her? Tanzing? In Punjabi called Tanzing. <laughs> so he climbed Mount Everest and he was asked, when he came down on the ground base, he, he was asked, how do you feel? He's saying, I feel very sad. 
He said, why? He's saying, because there's no ever, I will never find other Everest to climb. This was the highest peak. So when this book, I was holding it first time, when it came to me, I felt I have touched my Mount Everest because it was about, uh, I challenged myself so much in this book. I wrote this book when I was totally unemployed. I have no shame in saying this in America, but uh, I just closed my third restaurant and uh, I was on my way to nowhere. And here I'm locking the door of my restaurant and a call comes from a friend, Tashi, saying that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is in town. Would you like to meet him? And my question was, why? I'm just doing another walk of shame for my life. And it, this was 2005 end. So these things are not in the book. So it's important when I'm doing something about the book, I tell the something which is totally true story about what is behind the glamour and the, you know, the, the real project. I had no reason to go to His Holiness, but I still went there. I went to Beacon Theater, Beacon Theater it's called, on 75th Street, Beacon Theater, and there were about 3,000 people. And you know, when His Holiness comes, he has a more impact than President Obama who comes to New York City. When President comes and the streets are blocked, we all criticize him. Go back to Washington! <laughs> but we never say that to His Holiness. And something about that sacred power of his leadership, the way he leads us, I go and meet him. I still had to pay so many bills that day. I didn't care. I just wanted to see him. I don't know why. So eventually I went there with a big face of shame. And everybody asked, oh, you're another restaurant closed. <laughs> you will never learn how to cook. I'm like, OK. And this is the first person I met right at the Beacon Theater. I said, I don't know why it closed. There was a big building lawsuit. Oh, everybody says that. We have a lease problem. <laughs> so. I very quietly, humbly stood last in the line, and His Holiness starts walking. Now, this is something which is very surreal. It's called surreal. A double R, I think. <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking. I'm in the last of the line, and His Holiness comes. And I don't know what happened. He like, you know, he's a, he's a short man with a huge presence. Just humbly, like, you know, bows and keeps walking. And he comes and touches my forehead like this, and touches his heart. And he had beautiful silk cloth, just hands it over to me, and just goes away, as if nothing happened. So there's another <clears throat> American girl standing behind me. She just pushes me and says, F you. <laughs> and I'm like, wow. what did I do? He's saying, oh, you have this Bollywood effect. And I said, I didn't do anything. I'm like, I, I didn't even know it happened to me. She was so angry at me. Why didn't it happen to her? I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm like, what happened actually? So I didn't know what happened. But I went to the lecture, which I was not going to attend. I just went as a promise to my friend Tashi. And I go and sit in the lecture. And His Holiness sits there so quietly. And I remember he was sneezing that day. And he had this small handkerchief, which he would put back in his, you know, the clothes he wears. And he was sneezed at, like, you know, and it was like so real that, like, you know, he's a symbol of something so high, and even he has a cold. I'm just thinking about that. And then he talks about that, he's saying there's nothing as end ever in life. It's always changing a form and structure. He's saying people who think it's the end, they're not seeing beyond what they can achieve. And I was that one person who thought it was the end for me. I go back home in the night. <clears throat> I call my mom early in the morning. And I said, Mom, I met His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. She's saying, OK. I said, I'm going to finish my project. She's saying, which project? They said, return to the rivers. She's saying, what is that? I said, Mom, that's a, like, this is a condition happening in a native language. <clears throat> She's saying, what's that? I said, it's my book on Himal. She's saying, oh, no, no, don't write another book. Nobody buys your books. I said, oh, Mom, <laughs> that helps me. She, and she said, remember last time you wrote a book and you said oh, you sold only two copies? I said, yeah, but I bought one. So I just sold one, actually. <laughs> and she's like, why are you writing another book? I said, uh, she's saying, isn't that enough that your restaurant is closed and you don't have a job? And I said, mom, it's not enough. I just not enough. So she's saying, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Bhutan. And she said, where is that? I, can, no. I said, it's up in the mountains somewhere in Himalayas. So she booked me a ticket from New York to Bhutan. 
and that is when the real journey started for this book. I go to Bhutan. It is an unta if you guys know about Bhutan, you must Google that they don't have per capita income or anything like that. They have per happiness income, like kind of thing. I don't know what they call it. It's, it's something which is closest to living in paradise. That place just sucked me in. You know, I was, I landed and you have to land through the valleys, the, mount, the plane goes like this, and then the aircraft lands, it's a palace. Nobody disturbs nature, nothing. There were stories about that place which I will never be able to forget ever in my life. So I'm, I was totally in love with that place. I said, this is fantastic to begin writing and rediscovering yourself. All the lessons that were in the book started from there. And from there, I called, when I finished there, I was there for almost two and a half weeks. I called my mom, can you book me to Tibet? And she said, where is that? It's like, mama, don't ask me this question. Just call the agent and book me a ticket from. And she said, oh, that is a very expensive ticket. I said, OK. So I said, then I'm going to Kathmandu. So I know it, you know, I don't come from a very huge background. And I figured out that, you know, OK, I'm going to take a bus from Paro to Kathmandu. It took me three days, but that was OK. And not that anything was happening in my life that time. It's like nobody needed me at that point. And I started traveling by bus. And I figured out that the most beautiful stories happen when you're not in your comfort zone, when you're being awake. You know, it's always, there's an American philosopher. I can't pronounce his name, so I don't want to insult him. So he said that you will all, when you look back in your life, your life will not be defined about the nights you slept so well. They'll be defined by those sleepless nights. I can spell his name, but it was a difficult name. So, But I like that, because all these nights I was up and thinking, what do I want to do with this book? The whole project was about 2,600 pages when I finished it in almost five years. That time, Janoon was being born at one time of my life, where you know, in 1990, I read one article <clears throat> that India is one of the fastest growing countries in population, but it's a shame we will never get a Michelin star. And I said, what is a Michelin star? You know, there was no Google. Oh, sorry, I'm in a Google office. <laughs> <laughs> so you can Google anything. So you don't know what Michelin star was. So we don't have much reference of books at that point. And you, you know, every time you read some of my books, I'll say, we grew up in a pre-Google age, where we had one newspaper coming to my hometown. And there was no information besides that. So here, you're writing about such a foreign culture, which is in between China and India. And there are so many beautiful countries which are dominated by these old cultures of Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, Burma, North Pakistan, North India. You know, I thought this was, the, this was the strip I must focus on. And this is what I continued. And that's why the book is born. What a fascinating story. Seriously fascinating. But what I love about it is I love with what humility you talk about failures in your life. You have mentioned. Um, uh, one of the interviews that I was seeing, that when you first came to New York, you literally started with nothing. You had $3 in your pocket, and you ended up at a homeless shelter, and you stayed Christmas. there for a while. You got a blanket from someone. Tell us about the experience. You had, an ex you, had, you had a business in India, correct? Yes. And then you came to New York. So my question is, what drew you to New York? And you know, you, you were at a point where it scares most of us sitting in this room to be ever at that situation, to be in a homeless shelter. And you, you came out of that. So I'd love to know about that experience. So it, 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 it's a touching story. Please tell us about it. I came to America in December, on, not in December. My editor will again hit me. It's on <laughs> December. <laughs> you don't live in calendars. This is how I had to. I never went to a proper English school. so. I think it's my ability. It's not something which I should feel I lack behind something. Because then I could figure out, my publisher, she always says that grammar is not a language. There's only one language, and that's the heart. So I don't worry about grammar. They'll figure out in and on. So exactly. <laughs> I came on December 2nd to America. And uh, you know, there was a, there's an author in America. His name is Richard Bach. Some of us must have read this book called Jonathan Livingston Seagull. That was the first book I ever read about an, by an American author. My brother gave it to me. And in which Jonathan wanted to fly higher. But where I come from, it was a very homogeneous structure of life, where we only ate a few dishes. And besides that was not our 
cuisine, and we will not accept it. You know, that happens. But I came to America, I don't know, I think Richard Bach, that book really, that 80-page book was my Bible. And like a little child who likes to repeat, I would keep repeating, reading that again and again. My brother would say that, maybe you don't understand, that's why you have to read it so many times. It's like, <laughs> I said, it's a very difficult book, actually. <laughs> that how did he figure out to fly higher than everyone else? And I don't understand the story of going back home. Why did he go back and he wanted to teach everybody to be independent and to be, you know, that whole concept of American individualism? I was like so moved by this. I said, no, we have to live in groups. Like, you know, how we live back home. Everybody has to live a kind of similar life and everybody has to live almost in that group. So Jonathan Livingston Seagull will never be born, sometimes you feel. But I wanted to be somebody who defines cooking in a different way. And that is maybe one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to be at the greatest stage of cooking of Manhattan. I don't know, but maybe that's what we call destiny, which we can't define. But I came here, and you know, I don't know if you remember, if anybody has landed to, in New York pre-9-11, it was a very different country. 9-11 had changed, we, we changed so much of our priorities. It changed our mindsets. You know, even if you look at the literature written by American authors before 9-11 and after 9-11, there's a, such a strong subconscious shift which has happened. I know I'm speaking because I was right there when everything started changing. I was right standing right at Salam Bombay restaurant, just almost almost like one and a half blocks away from the site, I saw that shift. And that is something which has really got me so moved about the understanding of that this country is forever evolving. It is something which is the spirit is about, it's so invincible that they reinvent themselves. And that was something so important for me. You know? But before that, I remember that the, uh, there was a subway used to cost 150. And I'm, I go to a restaurant, I don't have a cell phone. Initially, at that point, you don't have prepaid phones. You only could get a phone with a social security. Right. I never had a social security. So, like, you know, those totally, I, I can call myself, yeah, I was illegal at that time. I forgot what was legal. I said, oh, I have a 10 years visa to come to America. I'm not illegal. <laughs> Sir, it was expired. Wow. Your entry was, and I'm like, I had no idea about those things. I was just come here to America to cook. I didn't have to worry about all these things. We never <laughs> worried about these things. So I didn't have money, but I only had three dollars. So I'm going to the restaurant. The restaurant is closed. Nobody informed me. Nobody called me. That on Christmas Day the restaurants are closed. So I'm walking up on Broadway near Tra near Canal Street, and there's a line of people, and I'm standing in the line, and uh, and a lady comes and she hands over to me a blanket. This is two thousand. December 5th, 25th, and exactly what I needed. I needed a blanket that time. I was shivering, and my socks were wet. It had just stopped raining. And she tells me, Merry Christmas. I don't know what happened. I just hugged her. I said, thank you. I needed this. And the guy said, I said, what is this line for? This thing, this is the homeless shelter, New York Rescue Mission. And now, you know, I, I go to New York Rescue Mission. I'm a part of their... I love everything about what they stand for. I think at that point, you need hope. More than you need shelter, more than you need food, more than you need a blanket. You need a hope that it's going to be OK. You know, It's OK. I, God is also saying, OK, I didn't create you as a very intelligent creature. But <laughs> <laughs> I am not repenting it because I feel that you will find your way back home. That one day, eventually, you will find your destiny. All you have to do is keep your head high. And I remember, and you know, when they gave me shelter to live there too, and I was so happy to save three dollars that I don't have to eat out, I don't have to try to <laughs> take a subway. Like I'm, like, and you know, it's okay in this country. You can talk about reinventing and falling flat on the. And I like when Oprah said, "It's great to fall on the ground. You see the world in a total new perspective." It's absolutely true that when you have fallen to the point when you don't know if you ever get a next meal or not, or you'll be thrown out of your apartment, you have such a different perspective of success when you get it. That is true. They say it's not about how, how many times you fall, it's how quickly you get up. 
that makes a difference. But you can. S uh, what is really in in impressive to see is you've gone through, you've gone through your fair share of hardships. You just mentioned that you had a third restaurant that closed down, and you're you know seeing where you are today. Uh, it must have changed you. There was one thing which was very strange, which always happened to me for a long time. And you know, I'll tell you a small incident. I live. In, I used to live in Queens, and. Uh, when everybody comes, most of the immigrants live in Queens, and we take train number seven. That's the best train even now. It's our favorite train. So I'm sitting next to a Sardarji, like a Sikh guy, who's like elderly, like he must be 70s. So he's asking me, like, son, what do you do? I said, uh, I make, you know, in my culture, we don't say I make food. We say roti banana. It means I make bread. You know, it's a very different, like, I know, like, you know. It's such a complex language, the you know, whole concept of so many languages in one country. So we never say, I, make, I cook food. You always say, I, I cook bread, when you translate it in English. So I said, my roti banana. He's saying, oh, don't worry. One day, you'll get a good job. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but that's all I know how to do. He's saying, why don't you drive a cab? <laughs> I said, I don't have driver's license. He's saying, oh, that's why you cook. I said, <laughs> <laughs> so he's saying, oh, no, no, you are young. You know, you can do double shifts in cabs and everything. You can do good money, you know. I'll put you through. You look like a decent guy. And I'm like, but I only know how to cook. He's saying, oh, my god, you're really dumb, he's telling me. Said, <laughs> <laughs> and then he asked me, I, so what is your, you have any future? I said, yeah, I'll be making food. He's saying, oh, you don't need any training to make food. <laughs> it's like, and then he asked me this very simple question, which has never left me. He's saying, so he saw that I was not moving away from this concept of that I cook bread, you know, literally. So he's saying, where did you learn it from? I said, I learned it from my grandmother's kitchen. And, and also, I learned how to roll a bread at the Golden Temple, which is like a big temple in Amritsar, which is where I was raised. And he took my hand and kissed it. He's saying, prasada is, means God's food. He's saying, go and serve God's food. He's saying, you continue to do that. He's saying, you don't have to drive a cab. Don't worry. <laughs> wow. It's interesting. So from your, I guess hardships change people in different ways. Some people, when they get to success, they forget about where they came from. But obviously, you haven't. You have uh, you've set up a number of humanitarian organizations, the big one being uh, Sakiv and Cooking for Life. Yes. So can you tell us something about these humanitarian organizations that you have created, and what's it about? It was after 9-11. It struck a chord, chord in your heart in a very different way. You figured out that one thing which will always sustain us is togetherness. And I remember that you know, I was uh, at the site, and People were a little bit, because you know I look so much like my cousins, kind of. So some people were like getting worried about me. Like, you know, what are you doing on this site? You know, it was a fear is a very dangerous thing. It is not hatred. Hatred is a very small part of fear. What are you doing here? And I'm like, uh, I want to help. You know, so the restaurant was right across the street from the site. So I will, every single day, initially nobody would come. But every single day, outside the restaurant Salam Bombay, I'll put a small buffet for all the people who are volunteering at the site. I will make one biryani, one dal, and I'll have some fresh breads. Because nobody was coming to the restaurant. After that, that area just died. The, you know, the Tribeca started crumbling because nobody wanted to take it as a tourist destination. You don't want to go. And people would tell me, we don't want to go to and eat. I would tell my friends, please come and support my restaurant. And they will say, I don't want to eat near a graveyard. And that would be like, oh my god, would I ever get out of this? It was like oh. something which was like so scary for an immigrant who was brown at that point, standing right on the site, who wanted to be of some support to even one soul at that point. And at that same point, you know, we had some riots in Queens. And there, a lot of Sikhs were, you know, there was a big assault and everything. And that is, again, pre-Google. 
And we don't have those images. Right now, we can get images of what is a langar. Langar is a community kitchen which comes from the Sikh temples, where the whole institution of Sikhism is based on that everyone is equal. They have no, there's no sense of division of societies in them. So when you look at langar, where I learned how to cook, so I drew a painting of a Sikh who was serving a little child, a beggar child. I don't know, I was imagining myself as a child or I was imagining myself as. So I drew a scratch and I stood on the site and I kept telling people, and you know, these are Sikhs, they are different. You know, these are the people who actually raised me. These are the people, you know, everybody. And there was a one professor from NYU, he asked me, he's saying, why are you doing this? I said, even if I could tell one person the story of who we are, you know, everybody has to tell their own story. And he said, continue to do this. This is the conviction which is make you stand out in the United States of America. That I saw you standing there for two hours. No one spoke to you. You were invisible. Wow. He's saying you're invisible right now. But as long as you believe it, you will become visible. So this plaque, what you're holding it, don't forget it. This is something which is representing you and your city and your people. Don't forget it. And I remember that was a very important, somebody patted on her back, on her, like, you know, that woman who gave me a blanket. It was a similar kind of moment for me when I said that it is very important if you believe in something, you've got to stand up. If you need to be counted, you need to stand up. And that is something which I learned because I was born with a very strange physical disability in which I never played throughout my childhood. So I have no memory of me playing as a child. I had club feet, which is a very common problem in the first world countries. But in my part of the world, that's a big problem. Your feet are inside, you're a ghost. You know? <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> Mommy, I'm a ghost. <laughs> that's what everybody in the class tells me. It's like, but you learned how to stood up. And that is what I felt that it is very important that what you do is, it cannot come from anywhere else. The source has to be within you. And I know, being a chef, I should, people say, people, some people tell me, just cook here, who cares what you're saying? No, it's important. It's important that I share in what I believe in. Because what will happen, that these, all these stories add up, and they become a small epic of your own life. And that is what my mom taught me. She's saying, if somebody says that you're a ghost, <laughs> tell them, thank you, angel. And wow. I did that, I said, oh, yeah. So the foundations all was started based on that, that there was an equal amount of awareness. There was a, some things I did with the Egyptian government right before they collapsed. And it was like, I wanted to have more accessibility on the world wonders. Now you would say, why would you do that? Yeah, I figured out that it was difficult for me to access simplest places where I need to. So Sake was so much based on creating events. We did events at the pyramids, at the Taj Mahal. I went planning a next one in Brazil, where we collect chefs and they all put the energy and food into it. You create awareness of events. It's, it's important. Mm -hmm. so. I agree. Not to forget where we come from. I want to spend some time talking about your book. Uh, you've told us how long you, you, t you took to write the book. It's, it's a big work in progress. But the most interesting thing, uh, there are a couple of things. I, I, I glanced through your book. And we spoke about it over lunch. I hope you enjoyed lunch, by the yes. way. Yes, <laughs> great. It's a big honor to have the guys eating at my restaurant. That's so awesome. Google's restaurant, I just did. <laughs> 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 but it is. Um, we, we take everything what we are successful. Exactly. All successful things are ours. But the one thing I, I loved about the, the book is um, you started with the Buddhist mealtime prayer. Yeah. And how do people in the Himalayan River Valley, how do they view their meals and the food they eat? And how is it so different from what the Americans do and their approach to food? See, I, I, I find it very difficult to compare two cultures. I have always had this problem of living in two different countries. But one thing which I love about appreciation of when people have such a high regard of sharing and there's a Buddhist mealtime prayer, and the book starts with that, saying that every grain is a sacrifice of life. May I be worthy of that sacrifice. May my unwholesome qualities turn to wholesome qualities when I consume this life. 
I thought that was something so beautiful. Because even if you're consuming rice, that has life. It has the potential tomorrow to fight against the gravity and rise to the sun and create a new crop. That is sexy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that is when true. we look at the magic of soil, you know, we saw the movie Wally, you know, and I was so affected by Wally that it is all about that little sprout which defines our existence on the planet. And that Buddhist mealtime prayer made me feel about a little grain that we are all, the day we don't see it, we are all struggling for that little sprout, which we don't even think it's so important. And in this prayer, they made that sprout as the center of the universe. Wow. So I, was, I said, you know, the book has to start from that kind of note. And how Americans eat differently? What Americans can do, the rest of the world can't do. We could create Google, the world That's just follows. You know, I was Googling Google headquarters on Google Maps before coming to the Google office. <laughs> like, how can you Google more than that? You know, it's like, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious, man? <laughs> but, you, as you know, we, one thing we also have to understand that America is a reflection of the world. We see traces of the whole world in the American hope or American dream. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there's something so powerful when you have, when you meet American kids who are, you know, and I feel so proud every day to be part of that cycle in some way, at least if I'm in the kitchen in Janoon. And I'm feeding that creativity of the American mind. This book on this high commission could be produced in America because of, because of the American, that curiosity to know more. And in this book, I say, you know, there are so many places where a lot of people will not be able to travel to Mustang, which is northeast of Nepal, where Nepal people have not gone. And it's like, it's so many difficult places where I went to. And I said, you know, where people can't travel, I'm doing a small thing of bringing that small piece of land of Himalayas to their kitchens through this book. So when you look at the American creativity of thought process, mm -hmm. that is something which is so different. The way Americans think, the way they write, the way they approach in a very global way. That is something which we all gravitate and we aspire from it. So I think it's, it, I could have never thought this as a very important project if I was living in Amritsar. Right. I possibly would have never thought that Himalayas could be something so large and massive and you know, splendor of the food and the culture and the people. Till you came to America and you figured out that you know, it's so important. I glanced through the book. The book is, it, it truly excited me, mostly. My book is I'm going to get you to sign it. No, I got this. But I read through this, and a lot of the recipes really fascinated me. And uh, I'm definitely going to use these recipes in my restaurant. I'm going to have a Vikas Khanna day. I loved so many. Uh, the simplicity is what touched me. The, the, the simple mustard greens, mm. uh, the simple, uh, they're such incredibly simple dishes. But the one thing, and I told you I was going to ask you this question, is about the 108 caves of meditation potatoes. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a very interesting place. It's near Lhasa. <coughs> it's approximately a three hours drive from Lhasa in Tibet. And, you know, I went to Tibet because we all go to Tibet because we love His Holiness. There's something about Potala Palace, you know, which is the, and Potala Palace is fantastic. If anybody has not done any, has not Googled it, must Google it. The, it has a red side and the white side. Red side is the parliament or the political side, and the white side is the spirituality side. So he says that both things should be in balance, in sync. And it is like approximately three hours from there. There's a place where they have 108 caves on the mountains. So I decided one day I'm going to go to all those 108 caves. And uh, on the way, they have these two things which are fantastic. One is they serve these potatoes, which are boiled potatoes, and they come in a plastic bag and the chopsticks. And you, know, that's, uh, you keep eating that starch as you travel through these mountains. And there was a second thing which was so shocking. It's a true example of our existence that how we define our cuisines and how we actually continue to live and thrive. They had made a small kind of a, a kind of, it looked like a soap, 
a batch of potato starch, which was boiled and made into this small block. It was sitting there. And it's noodles, actually. So I'm like, OK, but where are the noodles? And the woman is like, could you be a little patient? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but where are the noodles? This is just a block. You cut it. What do you do with it? So they had this small kind of a piece of uh, like a lid. You know, the, the lids which come out of the tuna box and everything. So that kind of the little finger handle. And then she had made holes in it. So what she would do, that she would slide over that little block of potato starch block, and the noodles will come out. Wow. That's in the book. And I'm like looking at this, and I'm like, wow, that is fantastic. So what she does is that she makes them, and then she tosses with little bit of garlic, chili oil, and all those things. But one thing which I also found very interesting is I'm not going against China. Please, nobody quote that. But I found a pasta making machine, which is more than 1,000 years old, wow. in northwest of Bhutan. And I'm going to show you a picture of that. And it is like a huge lemon press. You know, like the lemon press we have to squeeze lemon juice, or the garlic press. They had this kind of wooden thing. Now, this is that potato noodles with chili paste. This is how she figured out that there's a big block of potato starch thing, which was potato starch is cooked in water, and which is quite like a thick, like gelatin. It's very much like a jelly. And then she scrapes it with this little thing, and this is what comes out. And wow. I was like, this is a beautiful story. So the whole book, when it was created, it was almost 2,600 pages of research. The whole book was, would have gone, but then it will become very unuser friendly so, and cost effective. And mm. <laughs> like, shipping will be a problem. So Exactly. I can tell you right now, I can't serve that. To make that for a 1,000 bowls, I think I <laughs> will fall off. <laughs> you know, practice is what makes them so fast. They she, one scrape and bowl is ready. Oh my! Wow. How fast she was! It's like I'm, I love. And there's one more thing which I want to say about the dedication page of this book. This book is dedicated to this woman whom I don't know, and I will never possibly ever be able to meet her again. I'm quite forgetful, and I know that. So I had this small computer, Vio, that black one, the cheapest one I used to have. So I had everything documented there. And this is the last top 108 caves. So there was a small place, which was like, a, like last time I'm going to have butter tea. So I wanted to have my last butter tea in total peace. And then we had a small van, like you know the, the big Manuti van, which used to come in India. Like, you know, it's a 10-seater van. So my driver is like, run, run, run. So I ran out, and I forgot my laptop <coughs> in the bag next to my chair. And I'm, I forgot, and I'm totally excited. And I'm like, and now I'm getting carried away with the new sites and everything. I still had my little camera. I took all these pictures myself. You know, so I'm clicking more images. And suddenly, the bus stopped. There was a Tibetan woman. From the top of the hill, she ran down the slope to give my computer back to me. Wow. Incredible. And I'm trying to give her something, because I don't know how to react to this. Like, nobody has done this kind of. Running, running for me. So she shrugged and she said something. In Tibet and asked the driver, she's saying, she said that anyone would have done that. Wow. And she must have ran about two miles, wow. more than that. And oh, incredible. that sight never leaves me with, you know, the married women wear kind of apron, kind of looking dresses, and they're so beautiful. She must be in her 60s. Uh -huh. But her running down that hill and giving me the computer, is why this book is born today. I would have lost almost all my data, everything, all images. And more than that, wow. I would have lost hope mm -hmm. of that I can do it. And that hope led to another hope, and that led to another hope, which got me here. That is incredible. Um, I have to tell you, I spent two years in Delhi when I worked at the Maurya Sheraton. And that was when I was first introduced to Momos. I'd never heard about Momos before that. <laughs> there was a small little uh, restaurant yeah, behind yeah. in Chanakyapuri, where all the Pusa students used to go, yeah. and we would have Momos. And I think the first time I had, I think I must have had 60 Momos or something like that in one show. <laughs> it was so good. <clears throat> so you have covered Momos to a great degree in this book. Yeah. Give us something real quick about Momos. It's such an incredible dish. You know, in Momos is a very interesting dough. It's a very interesting dough. It's just flour, salt, and water. And then you use your instinct to the, it needs to be a firm dough. Because if you let it rest, 
covered with a wet cloth for half an hour. That's all you need. But a lot of people, when I was doing any classes or doing my training of my own chefs in the restaurant, they were very worried about the shape of the momos, that you know, that intricate shapes, in which we, 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 we do touch a lot of that shapes in this book. But one thing was, which is, I, I tell them, tell people, who cares how the shape is? But the beauty of momos is that you can stuff them with anything you have, any leftovers, any restaurant food which is left. It needs to be dry, for sure. And if you have minced meat, just add some salt and lemon juice to it. You can just stuff that in. Steaming is a great, healthy way to eat. But one more thing which I figured out that you can actually make momos with whole wheat flour too. Wow. And you can use a lot of grains, you know, too. And this is also, this is one of my favorite test stories about, you know, there's a, I go to this woman's house. This is in Paro. It's, uh, it's one of the capital, it's the capital of Bhutan. This is actually the only city in the world where there's no traffic lights. I think there's one traffic signal in Bhutan, in Bhutan the whole of the country. And nobody breaks traffic rules. You know, when I got my pa uh, driver's license, you know, again, I come back to driving. <laughs> <laughs> in Bhutan, they drive so well. They have so much respect for nature. They don't honk. They don't do anything. I don't know. It's a, it's a total different thought process in which they say, we don't honk not to disturb the other driver, but we don't honk to disturb the nature. Wow. So I was like, wow. So this woman has this, and she is making me the butter tea. If you've ever seen this movie called uh, Seven Years in Tibet with uh, Brad Pitt, the last line of the book is, the, the movie is that butter tea was never my cup of tea. This is a tea which is made with tea, little bit of milk, water, lots of yak butter, and salt. Wow. I know it doesn't sound delicious at all. It is not. <laughs> First sip, you will say, I can't be having this floating grease in my mouth. Like, are you serious? But you went to anyone's house. It was a, so I write about this that, you know, I got so obsessed with this butter tea. So in my little apartment in Manhattan, which is the size of a matchbox, I, it only smelled of butter tea. So anyone who would come to visit me, I'll start, and people are like, are you weird? <laughs> like, we're never coming back to your house again. If this is the next time you're going to do this to us. And I'm like, I, but you know, this woman had this kind of a stirrer, a whisk, which is from a tree. So I asked her, can I have that? She's saying, you can have anything, but you can't have this. It was given to me by my mother-in-law. I said, OK. So I love that. You know? A whisk I could not buy. It's like, but I wanted to take a picture of it to put in the book and say, eventually, you know, when I was walking out, her daughter gave it to me because she saw that my heart was like, oh my god, that's a whisk. It looked exactly like a whisk. There's a top of a tree, and they used that to make tea. I thought, this is really great. Not, and I thought that organicness is something which connects us all to something which is very pure. That simplicity. That is very, very incredible. I have to ask you, you know, that incredible story you told us in 2005 when the Dalai, La Dalai Lama touched your forehead, and then you now have him writing the foreword in Return to Rivers. How did that happen from you, you managed to get him writing for your book? That's incredible. Tell us about it. Mm, destiny? Pure, pure destiny. I always feel that there was something so honest in what I was doing when I was writing this. I was not worried about when my next, next meal is going to come, what is going to happen to my life. It's like, what am I doing? But there was something in the universe which was constantly guiding me and telling me, you are doing the right thing, son. And it was something is telling me that I choose people to do projects. Like There was a bigger power telling me that you didn't choose this project. I chose you to do this project. And when I met His Holiness, he was asking me questions. Like he was literally like to, trying to test me. So I went to, for meditation with him in Kal Chakra. is the biggest Buddhist congregation which happens in Bodh Gaya. Bodh Gaya is a place in India where Buddha was enlightened. So in Kal Chakra, we have a lot of people. And I thought I will never get to be sitting with him because you have Richard Gere there and everybody from Hollywood there. And, but he's good at looking at me. It's like, <laughs> but he pulls me on and he starts talking to me about the project. 
I'm like, really? And then there was an, another guy who was there who was complaining nonstop. Oh, you don't know, I have so much money, but I don't understand why my kids left me. My wife is getting married and she didn't even inform me, you know. And, and my Dalai looks at him and says, my friend, you need scotch. <laughs> Stop complaining, he tells them. <laughs> it was, you think, you started the sentence with saying that you are so rich. Stop feeling that about yourself. Stop feeling that. On top of that, you're telling me how poor you are because you can't connect to anyone. And I'm like, oh my god, like, look at his presence of mind. And then he tells me, and immediately looks at me and says, did you go to? I said, yes. I went to Amdo. Amdo is his birthplace. I knew it somehow that he's going to ask me that question. I don't know why. And I said, I learned how to make your favorite bread there. Is the Amdo bread in the book. And he just kept holding my hand. And that guy kept complaining in the behind, like, you know, but what do you want me to do with my life? You know, I have so much money. It's like, he does this to him and says, shut up. <laughs> but he wanted to hear the story of bread, which is his childhood bread. He goes back to Dharamshala. And within like almost three weeks, I get a letter from his office about congratulating me of accomplishing this project. And th that's a forward. Incredible. I don't know how many people in the world would be able to have this. Um, I am so impressed. I've got to ask you one last question as a as a chef, looking to you, you have accomplished so much. It's, it's so much. I mean, I, we could never dream of accomplishing 13 books and so many appearances. But you don't take time to rest. Is there going to be time for life anytime soon? Is there going to be a Mrs. Vikas Khanna? Is there going to be <laughs> something? You're going to take a break and just say, time to enjoy what I have accomplished. I feel that this platform is fantastic. You know, I went to launch this book in India. I wanted my motherland to see this book first. I don't know what, I'm not that patriotic. I take it as I feel. So Jaipur Lit Festival is the largest literary festival in India, where Oprah went last year. And then before that, Deepak Chopra has spoken there. Salman Rushdie was not allowed to speak there, but I was allowed. <laughs> I Good on you. More Good on you. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so they never had a chef there before, Jaipur Lit Festival. They never had a cookbook launch there. It's largest South Asian literary festival. So I'm just going there and I'm a little worried because I know there's going to be a lot of press. So I'm asking the people at the festival, do you rent people, like, you know, just to fill up my place? Like, can I get some? Like, can I? I don't want to be standing there alone that, OK, I came all the way from America to open this book. So all throughout, I'm asking people, so you know, can you come? He's saying, yeah, we'll come. It's like, I can pay you guys. You know, it's like, I'm like, I'm thinking, I should have had like 100 rupees notes, and I would give it to everyone. Please come for this. So I go there. There's a Bollywood director who's talking there. So he's almost like 100 people there. So I'm like, you know, can we tell these people to after this? That he's saying, chef, can you be a little less paranoid? You are, you are like scaring us. It's like, you know what? It's going to be such an insult. Like here I'm talking that I don't want to open this book in America first. I want to open this book in India first. And I called my mom and she's like, no, I'm not interested. That's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> nobody is ready to come to my book. And, like, <laughs> and, and they said, we put you in the Google Mughal tent. I said, I don't know what that means, that people have to Google my tent. Or like <laughs> so there's a place in Jaipur Lit Festival, it's called Google Mughal Tent. And they said, Chef, <clears throat> please, we don't want your anxiety going all over the place. We have people waiting here since last night in the tent. Wow. I went there, there were more than 3,000 people waiting to see this book being opened in front of them. Incredible. So. I felt that was my bigger accomplishment than having a life partner or having anything else in my life. Where I hold this book like this, and I could hear people yelling and crying, saying, I said, you know, this is my symbol of hope. You know, I said, so I'm there, and I looked at all these kids. And then it was difficult for me to get out of the crowd, because I disturbed that whole festival for that day. I know that. Hmm. Because I went up and I told them the story of you know, why I came back home. Because I said, because in my favorite book, Jonathan Livingston comes back home. 
I wanted to go back home and see how the home was. Wonderful. Well, just by saying that you know, no time for a life or a wife. <laughs> the, sexiest, the sexiest chef around. I don't know how many hearts are broken in the audience. <laughs> but truly an incredible story. And you know what, what is really, how you, you know how you can tell that you're talking to a real chef? This is from a tandoor. This, these hands really, really work. These scarred hands. You never need to go for waxing. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is burnt. Everything. Is. So you never need to go ever for If everybody wants to go get a nice free waxing, say, can I put my hand in the tandoor? So you get Look perfect clean waxing. <laughs> so people ask, you, so you wax? I said, no. I think, oh, but you have wax one hand. So tandoor. tandoor. Left hand is the kind of one. Anyway, what an incredible story. I am now going to open uh, to questions in the audience. Does anybody have any questions for? Vikas, Vinod here will hand you the microphone. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and Vinod will come over and give you the uh, microphone. Before 2005 and after, would you say, like, was there anything different that you did uh, that you, know, you achieved like, uh, you know, what you wanted and everything, like a lot of success? What was the difference before and after? The biggest difference I felt was that before you can, there was a time when I went to, when the transitional time of Indian cuisine, I would say from their reference, that a lot of people, a lot of friends we would meet who were totally in, not very approval of Indian cuisine. I hate curry, like you know, I heard that word many times. But after that I was convinced, I would patronize the cuisine, not the people. If you patronize something which is art, it is much bigger than the people. I think that is what I was convinced in 2005 when I had failed so many times. Because somebody will say, change this, and I'll cha run. I'll change it, because I wanted to patronize everyone. In the middle of this whole transition, I forgot that I would rather be a slave to art than to be a people. For me, the culture was the art. The food was the art. I just focused on that after that. I just stopped worrying about, even now, when something has to be done the right way, we do it. And I feel that people respond more to that than if you just keep changing for everyone's individual perception. And yeah, I, I didn't go to great schools initially. You know, cooking was, cooking was the only thing I did. I'm not, but one thing I figured out, you focus only on something you're convinced about. Rest is not important. Rest comes as a very important byproduct. I don't know if anything made sense what I said. <laughs> OMG. <laughs> OMG. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan. Um, <laughs> I actually have uh, started my own food page. Um, and I always, I'm an everyday visitor of your page. And that's when I came to know that you'll be in Google. So I somehow tracked down my friend that I really want to come to the campus and I really want to come and see you. Thank you. One question. I've sent you many messages on, messages on Facebook, but haven't <laughs> <laughs> had any response yet. <laughs> um, I sent you a link of my page. Hey, what do you think about my page? It's a food blog. <laughs> no, no response. <laughs> See, Vikas ji, this is why you should. This is why you should be married because when uh, that, my wife answers all my Facebook questions, <laughs> and she's always on top of things. <laughs> she's my publicist, so yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, again. I'm not the greatest person to, like, my, my, my lady who does my publicist. You can blame the publicist. Neeraj <laughs> <laughs> is here. I'm and busy man. <laughs> I'm just writing a big encyclopedia of, <coughs> on festive foods of India. And I start this journey from Indus Valley, what festivals they must be celebrating, and what foods they must be eating. In Greek, Greek people or Greeks, like what language, they say that artist dies, art lives. I'm a total believer of that. 
right now I'm that the story of Mirabai, which we heard in Indian mythology, who fell in love with Krishna. And she couldn't see anything else. She could even have consumed poison, but the love was so much greater for something else. So what has happened that I do have a lot of people who does my social media also, but I am the one who says that today God has given me a voice after being mute and dumb for so many years. At this time, I must discover more art. So in this space and time, I will never become a shopkeeper. Like I will never have pickles coming out in my name with a smile, nothing. I am the slave of art. And that is what all my energy goes. I'm, and I apologize in the middle of this if I'm ignoring something, which is I'm not. But I just feel that there's something that, that how many people given opportunity given that I live in India and America both. In America, they don't know that I live in India, and in America, India, they don't know I live in America. So in this whole confusion of time lapse, my whole life is like a different space. <laughs> But no, we have full time on when you are in America and when you are in India. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Can I cook we for you to apologize? <laughs> <laughs> Please do, yes. <laughs> wow. Can you get jambu here? You mentioned like, it's such a great alternative to uh, cumin-based tempering. Uh, jambu, as we call it in Uttarakhand. Oh but, my God! Where yeah. are you from? Uttarakhand, Uttar which is Kumau and wow! it's close to. So, I did my research right. Somebody, yeah, somebody I, figured out I was right. So <laughs> I think yeah, what is there is quite authentic. Like I think it's common to Nepal as well as Uttarakhand. Yeah. So can you get it? Right now, my only way is to smuggle it through. Like yeah. get it from India, basically. Like, yeah, <laughs> that's what I suggest to you. Smuggle it. <laughs> smuggle it. And you know, every time I'm coming back and uh, I'm at the airport and I'm just getting into the uh, customs and the guy says. You're the same guy from Gordon Ramsay, right? I said, yeah. Are you getting in some spices? I said, yes. He's thinking, okay, go. Wow. <laughs> but the only thing I do is I steal and I bring. And I make, I mean, everybody, oh, anybody recording also? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> love is love. But Jimbu is a very unique herb, which is used in Uttarakhand cuisine and it's used in Nepalese cuisine. One thing which is unique is that, you know, it is so delicate that what you do is that you heat the oil, not totally burn it. You add jimbu, instantly you add it over lentils. It's such a fragrant, holistic smell. It's only used in lentils in Uttarakhand and in Nepal. But if you ever would ever make a journey to Mustang in northeast of Nepal, where they, you must Google this. It's, Google is free for you guys anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Mustang, they, this is the place where they found about 1500 years old caves of Buddha. They use jimbu in making meat and in preserving meat. I was like, wow, how do I smuggle this? You know? <laughs> but you're right. Some things are very difficult when you talk about substitutions because you don't want to uh, destroy the beauty of it. So I put the jimbu, call it a jimbu. And a lot of people say, it's not Himalayan, it's Himalayan. I said, no, it's a Sanskrit word. At least for one time in my life, I'm right in my pronouncing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming and thank Vikas, you. thank you so much for like. coming here. Thank you. Sorry?